Go. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the Cathedral of St. John Berman. We are going to be day, today be talking about uh, a theme that is very consistent with our overall idea uh, this particular fall term, looking at the theme of Lex Arande, Lex Credende, the law of prayer is the law of believing. So what we pray is what we believe, or what we, what we pray should reflect what we believe. And there is no, perhaps no greater example of this than talking about the intercession of the saints. And, and what I added to this today is also uh, a topic that we covered two, about two and a half years ago. Some of you will remember that in December of 2016, we had the heart of St. John Berkman uh, here in Shreveport, and, and thousands of people came to venerate his heart. Uh, people who were not just Catholics, right? We had a large uh, community turnout. So um, I covered some of this then. I did a talk on, uh, on relics in December of 2016 and why we venerate relics. And so it seems to me like this was kind of a natural connection to make. If this was going to be my topic today, I'm going to go back and revisit some of that talk from December 2016 um, because I do think it's, it's so in keeping with, with what our with what our overall theme is. The, we have this historic Christian practice of asking the saints to pray for us, asking the saints to intercede for us, asking our departed brothers and sisters. They don't even have to be saints yet. I mean, I've had many people tell me, for instance, that um, they have been praying through the intercession of the five priests who died in the 1873 yellow fever epidemic. Since we elevated their story and have made them more, I think, obvious to the community, I've had people tell me that. Uh, many of us, of course, are asking for the intercession of our dearly beloved departed um, Monsignor Lacaz. And so I've had people, people comment about that. So, um, so it is the, one of the richest traditions in our faith that we do this. And so if you think about this idea of praying as we believe, then I think it's pretty obvious why we do this. Because the bottom line is we believe in eternal life. Right? We believe that those who have gone before us are more alive than we are. Because they're in the fullness um, of the light. And so um, it, it, is a, it is an ancient Christian practice. And I wanted to talk just a little bit about that today before moving on to talk about, about the veneration of relics, which is also timely. We have up here on the table... Uh, two, for instance, these two reliquaries contain tiny pieces of the shroud, uh, the shroud, uh, that were taken in 1931 when the shroud was moved from its old reliquary into a newer one that's documented in the photos that are over there on the wall. There's three of them in a row right there that document the bishops moving the shroud into a new reliquary. At that point in time, the Archdiocese of Turin authorized the taking of several relics, and so we have two of those, <coughs> actually three of those, because there's a larger reliquary over by the Ricci crucifix that also contains a piece of it. So it seems like this is a timely, a timely way to sort of interject that into into the conversation as well. So yeah, what we're saying is that we believe in eternal life, and I think one of the big questions that comes about is why did this practice of of, of asking the saints to intercede for us. Uh, why did it become subject to such scrutiny and such criticism during the 16th century Protestant movement? Uh, I mean, do any of you have Protestant friends that have ever asked you about this? Why? why uh, the question I get is, why do you pray to a saint? Or why do you pray to a dead person? I love that, you know, a dead person. Because usually the person asking that question is themselves a Christian. And so my response is, so you think they're dead? Is that what you think happens to us? Um, because they are more, as I said, more alive than we are. So, so why did this practice fall under such criticism, <laughs> such scrutiny? As did the veneration of relics, by the way. Uh, also, uh, I mean, I have, I have friends who are, who are not cradle Catholics or people who have recently come to the faith who find that to be a little bit odd. You know, maybe some cradle Catholics think that's odd. Why do you, why do you ask for the intercession of a saint, and why would you venerate a body part? You know, we had this conversation back when the heart was here. So, the simplest way to answer the question is to just quote the catechism, right? Because everybody accepts that as authoritative, all your Protestant friends. 
that's the easiest thing to do is to quote the catechism. But I am going to do that. Uh, all sarcasm aside, I am going to do that. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says this, Being more closely united to Christ, those who dwell in heaven fix the whole church more firmly in holiness. They do not cease to intercede with the Father for us as they proffer the merits which they acquired on earth through the one mediator between God and men, Christ Jesus. So the church acknowledges that there is one mediator. There's one mediator, Christ Jesus, and that by their fraternal concern, our weakness is greatly helped. So we could just sort of say, okay, that's it. The church has answered it. Uh, we believe in eternal life. We believe uh, that there is a church on earth, and then there is a church, well, the church militant, which is the church here on earth. There is a church suffering, which is where? In purgatory. And then there is a church triumphant. So, but... It has always been core, a core teaching of the faith that the church is one body. If you suspend time and space, the church is one body. We are in full communion with everyone who has ever gone before us, and they are just as much a part of the church, if not more of the church, obviously, than we are. And, and the ancient Christian had this idea that is reflected. How many of you were here when we talked about the Apostles' Creed? We looked at the foundations of the creed. We talked about the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. Well, in the Apostles' Creed is that line, I believe in the communion of saints. The communion of saints. That is an ancient, ancient Christian idea that there is a very thin veil that separates this world from the next. And that not only are they very close to us, but they can hear us, they can interact for us, and they do intercede for us. They want to help us. And I think the simplest way, really, to, to not to dismiss it, but the simplest way to deal with it is to, is to think about when was the last time that you had a situation in your life, and, and look, I am calling on the saints every day. I do, every day. So just the other day, I was in my office and couldn't find something. This is a silly example, but it's true. What do I do? St. Anthony, St. Anthony, look around. <laughs> right? Something is lost and must be found. And I've never had that fail me. I've never had that fail me. But when's the last time you had a situation in your life where you have phoned a friend or texted a friend, whatever, and said, could you pray for me? I'm going into this meeting this afternoon or I have this going on and I would appreciate your prayers. Do you know any Christian that gives that a second thought, that thinks anything in the world about reaching out to a friend for prayer. That scriptural, Jesus encourages us to pray for each other. Um, St. Paul, throughout his letters, talks about the benefits of praying for each other. As a matter of fact, many of his letters begin that way. I, I ask you to pray for me. So what is the difference, really, if we've already established that we believe in eternal life, if it is a creedal statement that we believe in the communion of saints, that they are just as alive as we are on the other side of the veil, what is the difference between me calling my best friend in Shreveport and asking her to pray for me and asking St. John Berkman to pray for me? What is the difference? So I think this is a perfect example of this lex orande, lex credende. We pray as we believe. It reflects that, that we believe in, in eternal life. So, um, going back to the Apostles' Creed, you might remember that that came from uh, an early uh, sort of a creedal statement, an, an interrogatory that was used at baptism. This is a review for those of you that were here. And that dates to the second century, to St. Hippolytus of Rome. So we know that that is an ancient, an ancient practice. And I think, I'm one of those people naturally, I guess, perhaps because a historian, this is my perspective, but, but I do think that the historicity of practices give them legitimacy, particularly when you're talking about the faith. If it is something that the early Christians did, then it's probably an apostolic tradition. So, um, why then did the church not pronounce or not address this until modern times? Why did the church feel no need to, to speak out to defend the practice until modern times? Well, like many things in our, in our faith tradition, the church is silent on 
practices that are ancient? Why do they need to affirm something that's always been done? Do you see what I'm saying? There is no need to defend something unless it's new, right? If you're doing something new, then you want to come in here and say, well, let me tell you why we're doing this. The church felt no need to defend this because it was an ancient practice. It wasn't until the Council of Trent, which was, which was convened in response to the Protestant movement, it wasn't until then, 1545 is when the first session meets, not until then that the church speaks out about this, uh, affirming the teaching on not only the intercession of saints, but also the veneration of relics, which is actually spoken to in a previous council we'll talk about in a minute. And the council declared this, this is 1545, quote, the saints who reign together with Christ offer up their own prayers to God for men. Now, obviously they don't mean to pray for themselves, they're in the presence of God, right? It is a good and useful, is good and useful to, to invoke them and to have recourse to their prayers and their help for obtaining benefits from God through his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who alone is our redeemer and savior. So again, answering that criticism that somehow we can't go, go directly to Jesus. Of course you go directly to Jesus. I mean, I do that too, right? We go directly to Jesus, but I'm still gonna phone the friend. Hey, do you mind putting in a good word? Do you mind in your prayers today remembering me? And so essentially what we're doing is we're asking the saints to do the exact same thing. So what I wanna look at then is, is out of this tradition, out of this beautiful tradition of asking for intercessory prayer from those who have gone before us, is looking at a, at a related topic, which is the veneration of relics. And I wanna talk about, you know, we venerate saints, right? We venerate saints, we adore God. So there are two different words. Venerare is honor, adore is adoration or worship. And so we're not even talking about approaching them with the same attitude that we bring to our, to our prayer or to our petitions that we bring before God. It's completely, should be a completely different demeanor. Now, are there abuses of practice? Are there people, are there cults, for instance, you could say in the Middle Ages, of people who worshiped the Virgin Mary? Perhaps, but that is an abuse of the practice and the doctrine. It's not the teaching of the church. So very closely related to this practice of, of asking the saints to intercede and the fact that we venerate saints, the fact that we call them saints, capital S-T, the fact that we call them that indicates our honor we hold for them. Uh, so very closely related is the veneration of relics, and I do want to spend just a little bit of time talking about that um, today as well. Let me get back to that particular file. So, as I mentioned, we talked about this uh, I gave a very similar talk um, back in December of 2016 when the heart of St. John Bertman was here uh, because we had an opportunity at that particular moment in the, in the parish history. We had a moment that we could, in our community, the community at, at large, to share something that was ancient and good and perhaps very misunderstood. There's perhaps nothing in the history of the church that is uh, more, where there is a more clear lineage down to us than the earliest Christian primitive practice of venerating the relics of saints. Venerate meaning honor. So, as I said, that gave us an opportunity. I'm getting an echo, I'm sorry. Let's see if I can do something about that. Is that better? Maybe, we'll see. This very honored tradition that we have uh, with a long and documented history. So uh, one of the ways I'm, I'm gonna sort of do this, I'll organize this by talking about, you know, what do we mean when we say we've been a writer relic, what is a relic? Uh, why do we do that? That's a question that, you know, I get, and I'm sure you do too. But I teach, of course I teach history of Christianity, so I teach a lot of students from the Bible Belt and, and very few Catholics. And so this is one of the, the frequent questions I get is, not just about this practice, but lots of things. Why do Catholics do that? Why do they do that? And, and I can guarantee you that anything that we do is expressed in our belief. It's expressed in what we believe fundamentally about the person nature of Jesus Christ, um, the nature of our salvation history. 
we can always find the intellectual answer. If you're looking for it, there is one. Believe me, you cannot outthink the Catholic Church. <laughs> you cannot outthink it. It's already been done. Um, and then talk a little bit about how it affirms what we, what we teach and, and how to keep perspective about that. So um, some basic vocabulary, sort of unpacking that word relic. You know, it, it literally means a remain uh, or something that you relinquish or something that you leave behind. Is, is a relic. Um, so when we say the relic of a saint, we can be talking about a, a part of their body. We can be talking about a part of their, maybe perhaps an article of their clothing, a prayer book, a crucifix, something that they owned. Um, so the word itself is a theological statement. That's what I want you to see. Look at the meaning of it, to leave behind. So if we say something is left behind, what are we really saying? Something has gone on. Something has gone before us. Right? This is what's left behind because that person is gone on. So we've already made a theological statement um, that positively affirms what we believe about eternal life. So... If we look at the classification of relics, this is just some basic, basic vocabulary. If you've ever wondered about what, why we call them, what we do, a first class relic obviously is body or body part of a saint. So for instance, when we had the, the heart of St. John Burtman here, well, actually we still have part of the heart of St. John Burtman in the reliquary at the altar. Did everybody know that? It's a first class relic because it's a part of the body. Interestingly, all of the instruments of Christ's passion are considered first-class relics. Anything to do with Christ's passion. The cross, um, the, the scourging column, um, anything, the, the nails themselves, uh, the title that would have been on the cross, any of that would be considered a first-class relic. There are really no second-class relics of the passion because there's no intermediary. Obviously, Jesus didn't leave any physical remains. Right? But he did leave behind, for instance, the shroud that he was wrapped in. Um, he left behind uh, what we believe to be the face cloth that covered his face. It's in, it's in Oviedo, Spain today. A very good belief, reason to believe that that is authentic. So um, those, are those first class relics or second class relics? They are first class relics. They are first class relics. And so the relics that we have of the Holy Shroud are first class relics. The reliquary we have over there that contains a piece of the true cross, a tiny, tiny, tiny little piece of the crown of thorns, um, and a piece of the scourging column, for instance. Those are all first-class relics. And I've had several people ask me about that, so they want to tell you that the, the historical journey of that particular reliquary, um, we don't, it's like any relic that you receive. It's, it's attested to by both tradition and can be attested to by, by perhaps the seal of a bishop, you know. Um, so someone, is, actually a couple of people have asked me, well, how do you know that's a piece of the crown of thorns? Well, how do you know any relic is authentic? What I can tell you is that I know that that particular reliquary, um, this particular piece of the crown of thorns, for instance, was gifted by King St. Louis IX of France to a monastery where it was there for several hundred years before it found its way to Turin and was gifted to the man who owns this collection. So, you know, I, I think that you can introduce doubt and skepticism in anything you want to. Um, but as people of faith, we might need to think how we think about those things. Because if nothing else, what any relic represents is a conduit to the divine, uh, even if we just contemplate the mystery of it. So. Um, so yes, those are first class, but my point was to make that those are first class relics. So a second class relic then would be anything that was worn or touched, uh, except in the case of the shroud, right? Because Jesus didn't, Jesus is kind of an extraordinary um, example of leaving things behind. Um, but anything that a saint would have worn or touched would be, would be a second class relic. And then uh, this is more of an oral tradition, a uh, really that developed in the early church. Uh, not an oral tradition, I'm sorry, a, a tradition of practice where pilgrims would take their own personal objects 
and touch them to uh, a first class relic or the shrine of a saint, and that would become a third class relic. How many of you use, for instance, the holy cards of St. John Berkman and touch them to the heart reliquary? I mean, many of us did that. Okay, so those become third class relics by doing that. Um, the same is true of, of taking any holy card and touching it to one of the reliquaries of the shroud. You're creating a third class relic. So we have in the display cabinet over there, we actually have uh, a, a reproduction on wood. It's about this size of the title of the cross, okay, the Tatulus Crucis, which is held at the Church of the Holy Cross of Jerusalem, which is in Rome. St. Helena, who came back from the Holy Land uh, in the early fourth century, mother of the Emperor Constantine, went to the Holy Land, and she's the one, of course, who found the Passion Relics, brought the True Cross back into Europe. This is a discovery that she made. It was found, it, it actually today is in her private chapel, um, which is a subterranean chapel there. If you ever go there, make sure you don't forget to go downstairs. That's where the good stuff is. And this particular title, along with a large piece of the True Cross, is in a very special case there in her chapel. That relic that we have there has got two Episcopal seals on it, one on the front, one on the back. It was touched to the true title in Rome. So we have the bishop's attestation that that was touched to the true, to the true title. Therefore, it is what kind of relic? It is a third class relic. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. So all of these things would say that, that once you have the basic definition, you begin to understand uh, more about how and why we approach these things with the honor that we do. So the oversight of relics uh, is left to, to actually this particular, uh, particular body. The Roman Curia technically oversees first and second class relics. There is no oversight of third class relics. That is something that is that is left to the, to the, to the individual um, private devotion. Um, it did not become under the oversight of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints until 1588. So anyone who was canonized before 1588, that was done at the local level, the local bishops primarily did that, decided if a person was worthy of being venerated, the decision was made sometimes very locally. The regulation of those relics before 1588, uh, therefore, was not as tightly controlled as it has been since. And many of you know that this was part of the criticism of the Protestant movement, is that, and it's true, we have to, we have to face that, we have to acknowledge that, that there were abuses in the trade of relics. And uh, the, the Middle Ages particularly were a time when um, you know, you could um, go into a pasture and pick up the bone of a cow and pass it off as, as a femur of a saint. I mean, well, they don't call it medieval ignorance for nothing, right? <laughs> and, and so there, there is this natural suspicion, I think, among all of us, because we live in this post-enlightenment world, there's a natural suspicion among all of us of anything that has a footprint in the Middle Ages, right? And, and that is not necessarily a bad thing, uh, but it's just like the shroud itself, which we cannot place in an undisputed history before 1355. We know that there are cloths that are described like it before 1355, but we can't make that unbroken chain. And for the 21st century mind, we want what? Proof. We want proof. Yeah. The question is no longer by what authority do you say it, the question is, prove it to me. And so if, if that's what people want, um, well, I can't do that. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. But this certainly, this history is what introduces that kind of natural suspicion that we would have. I would also tell you that the church does not pronounce on the authenticity of any relic. They do not pronounce on the authenticity of any relic. They will tell you that a relic is worthy of veneration. Okay. Um, which means that it has a good historical chain of custody, which means that we have very good reason to believe that this particular item was associated with the saint and the life of the saint. Uh, but the church will not say that it is authentic. The church does not pronounce on the authenticity of any of them. Um, and obviously this is the same body that, um, 
that oversees the canonization process uh, today for bringing a cause for an individual to be examined. Is their life worthy of being a servant of God or being declared venerable or beatified? We gotta have miracles, people, for there to be a beatification and a canonization. There have to be miracles. Okay, so the Catechism of the Catholic Church makes it very clear that this practice is not in question. And I want you to note the use of one word here particularly. One word. The religious sense of the Christian people has always, always found expression in various forms of piety surrounding the church's sacramental life, such as the veneration of relics. Always. Canon law of the church addresses the treatment of relics. Um, but this is a little sticky widget right here we'll talk about. It is absolutely wrong to sell sacred relics. Okay, so we got a piece of the Holy Shroud. Can we list it on eBay? No. If it is absolutely wrong to sell holy relics, what about purchasing holy relics? <laughs> Somebody had to sell it <laughs> to purchase it. <laughs> is it wrong to purchase a relic? <laughs> These are the great moral and ethical questions I love to stump people with. Let me submit to you why it's not. You notice, notice what it says. It is absolutely wrong to sell sacred relics. If you purchase a relic for the purpose of restoring it to its proper use, to its proper veneration, to be in a community of the faithful, to be the object of veneration as was intended, is that wrong? Okay? There's a whole theology surrounding this called the rescue of relics. That, that because we live in a completely secularized, commercial, and let's face it, capitalistic environment, people go, you, if you don't believe me, go on eBay and look. Just type in relic and see the number of hits you get. So if you purchase a relic on eBay and you bring it to the cathedral and you place it in a reliquary, it's for the community of the faithful. Is that wrong? No. But how would we know that it's a real relic? Well, most of these are authenticated. Okay. And actually, there are, there are um, now in the Middle Ages, this was not true. People would, 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 um, would not put the, 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 the authentication papers or even tear off the wax seals, the Episcopal seals that are on them, because that would get them in trouble if they sold it. See, they couldn't be tracked. And so that's part of the problem with many of the medieval relics. But today, I mean, how many of you remember uh, Father Martins who came with the treasures of the church, who came with all of the relics that were displayed here in the parish hall? He's an excellent resource. I mean, I have actually contacted him on several occasions about relics that we have to, and he can look at the, at the certificate, at the, at the seal, and tell me if something is authentic. So, yes, I mean, it, it, is, it is an ethical question, isn't it? But, but if, think about it falling into perhaps the wrong hands to be used for another purpose. Um, and, and relics should be in community. They shouldn't like sit on your private breakfast table. I mean, I, I firmly believe they should be for the, the good of the, of the community. So um, it says they cannot be transferred on a permanent basis without the permission of the apostolic see. And so that is a, a, a process, an ongoing process, for instance, that we will go through make sure that it is okay for us to have what we have, to what we have been given. Okay, so the point is that this practice is so important. That was my whole point of telling you this. It's so important that canon law of the church addresses it too. It is that important. So again, going back to why we do this. This is a great question, isn't it? Why do you do that? Uh, isn't this kind of a creepy thing? I've gotten that before. Um, I've had people say, the heart of a saint, why? Why would you take his heart? You know? Um, so looking at the veneration of relics from the perspective of sacred scripture and sacred tradition, there are no gaps. There's absolutely no lapses in this practice. There's no inconsistency, uh, nothing that detracts from the fundamental belief that supports it. And I would ask you, you know, here's it here, for instance, this is in this is in the Old Testament. A second Kings tells us this. 
So Elisha died and they buried him. Now bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year. And as a man was being buried, a marauding band was seen, and the man was cast into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. The Acts of the Apostles is very clear. Some of you are probably familiar with these passages, right? When Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on one of them. People who were wanting to be cured, wanting to be healed, would follow the apostles, hoping that even the shadow of Peter would fall on them. Peter was still alive, right? And then uh, we're also told later uh, that uh, God worked extraordinary miracles at the hands of Paul. When handkerchiefs or clothes which had touched his skin were applied to the sick, their diseases were cured. So this is, a, this is a practice, a belief of the earliest Christians, those described in the Acts of the Apostles. Um, I particularly like the way the Council of Trent, again, going back to that Reformed Council of the 16th century, I particularly like the way that they expressed something uh, in the 16th century um, that, um, that speaks directly to this. Do I have that? No, I don't. Okay, I don't have that. Uh, but what they say is that um, that th it, this is the council is addressing, remember, from a Protestant perspective. Okay, they're, I mean they're they're answering a Protestant criticism, and their answer to it is this: Why multiply proofs if the clothes, the handkerchiefs, and even the very shadow of Peter and Paul, while yet on earth, and they sort of uh, highlight that while yet on earth banished disease and restored health, who will deny that God can still work those same wonders by the relics of the saints? Who would not be convinced of the honor that the, the honor due the saints or the help they give us by the wonders wrought at their tombs? These are facts which St. Ambrose and St. Augustine, most unexceptionable witnesses, as the Council of Trent calls them, St. Ambrose and St. Augustine, they declare this in their writings, not that they heard, nor that they read, but that they saw for themselves. Does that St. Ambrose and St. Augustine both testify, having seen this in their lifetime, that miracles were wrought at the tombs of the saints? So, uh, Trent is affirming both sacred scripture and sacred tradition. They, use up, they hold up these scriptural examples and these examples from our sacred tradition. So we definitely have a lot of archaeological um, examples uh, of this, of, of early Christians making pilgrimages, for instance, to tombs, to holy sites, um, the sites of martyrdoms, for instance, in the form of ancient graffiti, for instance. We know this to be true. Uh, such practices are chronicled in early monastic accounts that we have beginning in about the 5th, 6th century. We have accounts of, of pilgrim, pilgrimages being made to the, to the tombs uh, of saints or, or sites of martyrdoms. So we have no doubt, therefore, that this was an early Christian, uh, an early Christian practice. And let's face it, it's a way to tangibly connect to something that is now intangible. It's a way to visibly connect to something that is now invisible. And the church is both of those things, right? It is visible and invisible. And in the visible realm, we always seek the connection. To the invisible. We're, we're actually, I think, compelled to do that. So beyond these examples, just these examples, um, um, th this is an ongoing uh, current that you see throughout the life of the church, throughout the Middle Ages, into the early modern period, right into today. A first century text, we've talked about this before, um, the Didache, do you remember talking about that? It's, it's mm -hmm. subtitled, The Lord's Instructions to the Twelve Apostles. It may be an apostolic text. We can't say that for, for certainty, but it's a manual on how to do church in the first century. And um, for instance, it addresses things like baptism. It addresses things like the Eucharist, how that's to be done. Um, um, it talks about catechesis of people who want to become followers of the way. They're still calling it followers of the way. We're not even Christians yet. So it's an early, early text. And in the Didache, it says this, seek daily, seek daily the presence of the saints. So that, again, is another early reference to us wanting, 
documenting the fact that we wanted to connect in this tangible, material, and incarnational way. Because hopefully, you know, you, you see that at the heart of this is an incarnational theology. God became man so that all of this created order is imbued with his grace. Every single thing here, everything is good. Everything that he made is good. And because he united himself to our created order, everything in the created order is good. So yes, a relic of a saint is imbued with God's grace, perhaps more so than our physical bodies are. Uh, that's always been the thinking. So the earliest complete martyrology that we have dates to 155, to the martyrdom of St. Polycarp. Um, a martyrology meaning the account of a martyr, by the way. He was executed by the Romans in the year 155. The church in Smyrna, which is where St. Polycarp was from, um, now, again, I've talked about him a little bit before. The Apostolic Fathers. So St. Polycarp of Smyrna is a first generation. He was a disciple of the Apostle John. He knew John. Uh, we have good reason to believe. Actually, he tells us he was baptized by the Apostle John. So um, he is this early first generation. And the church in Smyrna, which is located um, Asia Minor, y'all know where Turkey is? Okay, so on the Aegean Sea uh, is where we're talking about, in case you're wondering. Today, I think it's Izmir, Turkey. But anyway, they provided a written account of his martyrdom. It's the first complete one we have. He's not the first to be martyred, obviously. But he is the first complete account that we have because the church in Smyrna wanted to provide a written account of this to the church in Philadelphia. Uh, a, neighboring, um, a neighboring community, Polycarp, um, would have known these people. The, the two churches, the two church communities were, were in communication, so we have this great record. Um, and this is what... Uh, follows in their account. Now, now, Polycarp was to be burned at the stake, but when the fire was lit, the flames wouldn't touch him uh, because of his holiness. So one of the Roman officers <clears throat> who was present at the execution uh, stabbed him with a dagger. So what follows is the account, I'm going to read part, uh, just a portion of it, is the account that the people from the Church of Smyrna, this is what they witnessed about their beloved Polycarp. His bones were more precious than jewels, finer than pure gold. Why? Because God will work wonders through them. Okay, so these people believed that that the remains of St. Polycarp retained the full holiness of his life's example, right? The fact that the flames wouldn't touch him because he was so holy. So, so what we see here is the earliest account of a community venerating the relics of a man who wasn't even sainted yet. We have lots of examples of this in history. Um, I think Father Peter many times has told the story about St. John Bergman, how when he died and they laid his body out, right? People already knew that he was going to be a saint, and in fact, that's the reason his heart was removed, right? Long before he was sainted, he was a living saint. Um, the, the, uh, there's this, this also very um, pointed example um, in the 12th century, of St. Thomas Becket, who was murdered in the cathedral at Canterbury. He was murdered uh, at, 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 in a transept of the cathedral there. And he was entering the cathedral, of course, for evening prayer. Any of you that, that know the story know this. And um, he was, he'd angered the king, and the king had pronounced at a banquet the night before, is there no one among you who will rid me of this meddlesome priest? So four knights rushed off to Canterbury and arrived just about the time that Becket was entering for evening prayer. And they took out their swords and just butchered him in the transept of the church. 
And what's interesting to me, more always been more interesting to me than the account of his murder, which is interesting enough, and the events surrounding that, is the response of the community of Canterbury. What do they do? They are rushing to soak up his blood in cloths. They're taking pieces of his hair, right? Somebody's trying to take a fingernail. This is the response of the community, which might seem to us to be a bit macabre, right? Except when you consider that for the medieval mind who understood this far more, far better than we do in our enlightened world, they understood the holiness of this man. That he had, in fact, just been martyred. So, uh, lots of examples of this in history that, that, that draw back upon uh, the example of this community in Smyrna in the second century. Um, and so, as the Council of Trent said, which I've already referenced, um, this is a testimony that goes back to the fathers and doctors of the church. It's overwhelming and comprehensive, beyond dispute, above reproach. Nobody questions this practice. And as a matter of fact, if I quoted every single father or doctor of the church who writes about the veneration of relics, we would be here until next Sunday. And we could just resume whatever the next lesson is, I suppose. I cannot possibly provide you an exhaustive list but I can provide you a few that carry a little extra weight. St. Jerome, is St. Jerome painted here by El Greco, of course, just saying, lived in the fourth century, uh, secretary to Pope Damas, Pope St. Damasus, and you remember was the translator of the Vulgate, translated the scriptures into Latin. Uh, he was a contemporary of St. Ambrose of Milan uh, and St. Augustine of Hippo. All of them, are, remember, are Latin doctors. He explains it well. We do not worship, we do not adore for fear. We should bow down to the creature rather than the creator. But we venerate the relics of the martyrs in order to better adore him whose martyrs they are. So St. Jerome, it makes an early distinction. And obviously, because he's doing this, there's already some question in the Christian community, right? The fact that he, need, he feels the need to make this clear. We are not adoring, we are venerating. Um, and the context for this is actually a letter. This comes from a great letter. And I know I may have referenced this at some point to you guys before, but, so forgive me. But this is so great, I have to say it again. Well, it's entertaining, so I have to say it again. The context of this particular quote, it comes directly from a letter that St. Ambrose wrote. Um, actually, it's kind of a gossip session. I guess would be a better way to say this. Um, he's answering criticism. He's writing to a friend, and he's answering the criticism of another priest, a priest who is criticizing Jerome's teaching on several things, but particularly this, this practice, the veneration of relics. Uh, the, priest name, the priest name he's criticizing is Vigilantius, which <laughs> makes him very memorable to me for some reason that that's his name. But anyway, um, when, when Jerome is writing this letter to his friend, I want to give you a direct quote, what he says about Vigilantius. He says, quote, I cannot mention his name without using profanity. <laughs> so the reason I love this is because this is St. Ambrose. He's a doctor of the church. This gives me great hope. <laughs> it should give all of us great hope, right? So, um, he goes on to say, quote, I am surprised, this is the best part even, I am surprised that the reverend bishop in whose diocese he is said to be a presbyter indulges his mad preaching, and that he does not, with apostolic rod, nay, with a rod of iron, shatter this useless vessel of a man and deliver him for the destruction of the flesh so that his wretched spirit, his wretched spirit might be saved. May God will that someone cut out this man's tongue. So Jerome tells how you really feel, right? But that, to me, this letter so beautifully underscores, well, not just the fact that the church is the same in every age, right? That humans are humans across the board. But it also underscores the fact that this, this practice was so revered, that it was so central to the Christian faith, that for someone to criticize it evokes this kind of a response. 
from the bishop, I mean, from, uh, from, uh, from St. Jerome, who is secretary to the Pope. Um, it evokes that kind of response. And, and St. Jerome had kind of a, had a little bit of a temper, let's just say, had a little bit of a temper. So, um, in 1680, uh, we have this, this interesting portrait of St. Augustine of Hippo uh, that I've used here as his background. But in his City of God, a text that St. Augustine wrote about the year 426, he um, is writing about the world that he lives in. He's responding to the historical events that are going on around him. Uh, most importantly, the fall of the Western Roman Empire. The empire is literally crumbling around him. And there is a lot of pagan criticism, those non-Christians in the empire, who were blaming the collapse of it on Christians. You know, look, we were fine. We had a great empire going until Constantine became Christian. And then the empire converted at the end of the, at the, end of the fourth century. And look at where we are now. We're being overrun by these barbarian tribes. So Augustine is directly answering these criticisms by pagans to give you that, that context. Um, the Goths had just visited Rome for the first time in 410, so that's kind of fresh in the memory, if you will. They're going to return with a lot more of their friends uh, a little later. But in it, St. Augustine basically argues that it matters not if Rome is falling. He says it doesn't matter. Empires rise and empires fall. The only city that matters is the city of God. And it's the whole pretext of the book. Talking about that eternal city, the, the place where everything is perfect and ordered uh, just the way it will always be. And so he's pointing us to, to that divine destination that we're all going to. Where he says our eyes should always be fixed. I should, I should always be fixed upward, he says, to that eternal place. And he points us directly to that eternal place through the relics of the saints. As a conduit to the eternal, he says, quotes this, For even now miracles are wrought in the name of Christ, whether by his sacraments or by the prayers or relics of his saints. So again, we have this great strong affirmation from a powerful voice in the early, well, he's the dominant voice of a thousand years. We have this very credible testimony from him about why we do this. He goes on to say, quote, I have myself seen this and I know this to be true. I have myself seen it and know this to be true. Uh, St. John Chrysostom, who is uh, also called, uh, call that because of course the word, Chrysostom means golden mouth or golden tongue. He was this great preacher, great orator. Um, gave a homily in the year 407 where he mentions uh, the queen of cities. So we assume he's talking about Constantinople in 407. is probably where, where he is. In our most beautiful church, he's referencing the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. On a major feast day of a saint, he doesn't tell us which saint, unfortunately. But we do have that text that gives us some clues about where he is and when it is. And we have the rest of his homily, however, that says um, something very interesting as well. As the waters of a spring pour forth and are not held back by its bank, but overflow and overcome, thus it is with the grace of the Spirit that resides and inhabits the relics of the saints. Again, this fifth century, there seems to be this need of these fathers and doctors to speak out about this. Uh, to keep this, this practice, perhaps in the wake of the fall of the Roman Empire, there is more pagan influences, but he clearly is wanting to, to, uh, to keep that, that out there. Okay, so, um, all right, so that is St. John the Baptist on the right. Does everybody recognize that? St. John the Baptist over on the far right. Y'all got that? Um, Chrysostom. Uh, next to him is John the St. John the Evangelist. Yeah. Anybody wants to know who those people are? Um, who else is in there? St. Theodore. Uh, you see him in his armor over to the right. And then who are the women? Okay, we have a clue. One of them is holding an ointment jar. So St. Mary Magdalene. That's right. St. Mary Magdalene. 
uh, who's, she's actually the one looking directly out at you. Now, this is why I love this period of art. This was the idea was to have to have women look more bold. You know, this is a 16th century painting, so so she's gonna look very bold. She's gonna look directly at you. She looks a little confused actually to me, but anyway, <laughs> there there's also of course Saint Lucy. She's got her eyes, but so you can tell who she is, uh, Saint Lucy, and also with her I think is Saint Catherine to the far left. I believe it's supposed to represent a Saint Catherine to the far left. But anyway. Um, all this art commentary is just free. You didn't even pay for that this morning. I'm sorry. The point is that St. John Chrysostom, who, again, is this powerful voice of the early, uh, early church, is um, depicted here in art, shows the way he is standing between St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist, depicts him in a way that tells us much about how the early church viewed him that he was a voice of authority. He's right up there with the John the Evangelist and John the Baptist. Okay, so the Second Council of Nicaea, which is the last council to meet while the church was still one before the Great Schism of 1054, the Second Council of Nicaea directly addresses the practice of the veneration of relics, directly addresses it, affirms and echoes the voices of St. August, of St. Jerome, St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, St. John Chrysostom, uh, a miracle actually had occurred uh, at the Council of Chalcedon in 451 um, involving the relic of a saint. So, so the, um, the Second Council of Nicaea begins with an introduction uh, talking about remembering that particular, um, that miracle that happened at a church council. So Second Nicaea affirms that honor is not really paid to an inanimate object you're not venerating the bone, right? The honor is paid to the holy person, the holy person. Because of that incarnational theology I talked about a minute ago, because of the incarnation, our basic Christian doctrine, we believe that everything is imbued with God's grace. Everything is good. Restated, uh, basically, that the remains of saints, no matter how small, contain the full holiness of that individual. So the fact that we have a tiny little piece, for instance, of St. Charles Borromeo, we have the fullness of his holiness. It's not, we don't have a measure of his holiness related, you know, prospectively to what size the relic is. It's the fullness. And the same is true, of course, of the pieces of the shroud we have. It's as if we had the whole shroud uh, in terms of its, what the, the God's grace being there. So... This, this quote from Canon 7 of 2nd Nicaea stipulates that no new churches can be constructed without a relic of a saint. So, you know, we have a relic in our altar, mm -hmm. right? All churches do. No churches can be built without them. And this has been the case since at least the 8th century. It was a practice before, but it's certainly true now that... And, and look at the statement that it makes that answers, I think... Uh, sort of answers any question we might still have about the validity of the tradition, uh, just how entrenched it was, right? In the future, if any bishop is found to have consecrated a church without relics, let him be deposed as someone who has flouted the ecclesial traditions. That's just how important this was and is. The canon... This Canon 7 of 2nd Nicaea of 787 is still valid. All of the canons of the Ecumenical Council still hold. So this is still the law of the church. Now, this leads to some really, because, because no new churches can be consecrated without having the relic of a saint, this leads to some really great, rich, wonderful medieval stories about the translation of relics from one village to another how people would have these all-night processions to, to transfer a relic from one village to another. It would become an entire community event. There would be people uh, would not leave the relic. In other words, it would be housed overnight perhaps in someone's barn or someone's sacristy or, or maybe even inside the church itself, but that no one would leave it. And, and people organized vigils. And it's these incredible stories of piety that come about because of this particular practice. That means, were there abuses? 
Yes. And it does us no good as Catholics to, to try to deny that this didn't happen. If anything, the fact that there are abuses in our history indicate the humanity of the church militant, that we are in need of redemption, right? And, and some of the worst corruption that happens is, of course, in this, this medieval period when you have a void of authority, you have the rise of kingship, but not yet secure. So you have bishops in the church who are quite worldly. You have abbots of monasteries who are wealthy and worldly, and they are overlooking the abuses that are surely going on. So that's why I said earlier, you know, I think it's perfectly appropriate for us to have a healthy suspicion about anything that has a footprint in the Middle Ages. Um, so yes, there absolutely were uh, abuses. I mean, how else do you explain that John the Baptist has three heads? <laughs> right? Now, does somebody have the real head of John the Baptist? Yes. Now, it depends on who you ask, but... Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, there, there, there are that. Um, lots of stories of abusive practices. One of the early things I think that Protestants are also reacting to in the 16th century is not just the abuses of the transfer of relics. Um, although, how many of you ever watched that great, actually it's a book by Ken Follett that they made into a miniseries, The Pillars of the Earth. Did anybody ever see that? Okay. Put that on your Netflix watch list right now, The Pillars of the Earth. It is about a community in the 12th century in England building a cathedral. That's what the story is about. And it, it, it's a great perspective, not just on medieval society, but on the piety of these people, the building of this cathedral, the drama of the families involved. You know, that's got to be part of it. But, but also some perspective about how our work is never completed. You know, what you do in this life is never really completed because you are setting up the next generation to follow in your footsteps. And these men who built these magnificent medieval cathedrals might never see, might never live to see anything more than a wall finished. But they would never live to see the cathedral finished. You know, but that wasn't the point. Pillars of the earth. Well, in the pillars of the earth, there's this great scene which probably makes some Catholics flinch, but I think it's very true. The abbot of the monastery <clears throat> in this local village, but there's a fire, and the part of the crypt is destroyed, and um, they have lost the head, uh, and I'm just going to make up a name, St. Swithin, I don't know who it is. It might have been St. Swithin's monastery. Anyway, they've lost the head of their, of their patron saint, and therefore, because of the way the medieval world worked and because of the practice of pilgrimages, they were going to be, they were going to be experiencing a, probably a significant loss of revenue to their monastery. People would not come if they didn't have this relic. And so what does he do? He goes into the crypt and he gets the head of somebody else and he puts the head in the, in the reliquary. Right? Like nobody will know. He replaces it. And the pilgrimages resume. And we could talk all day about the ethicality of what just happened. Is it an abuse? Absolutely. Do you have any business doing it? Absolutely not. But then when you look at the individual, the perspective of the individual pilgrim who's making that practice of devotion, who that, that's part of their personal piety, are they any less connected to the divine than they would be otherwise? And so I, I think that it, it speaks to some really deep ethical questions we don't have time for. But um, all this is to say that that's part of what the Protestant movement is reacting to is the knowledge of this and wanting this to be a pure. Uh, if, if you're going to do it, it needs to be pure and, and you need to be honest about it. And, and I think that's right. And I think that that's one of the things that the Protestants brought to our attention. It's one of the reasons that Council of Trent addresses this specifically is because of that very valid issue. But one of the things that, that the Protestant movement, I, I'm going to be very honest, I think got wrong about, about our practice of asking saints for intercessory prayer or our practice of venerating relics is that they equate it to magic. Right? Have you ever heard this? Yeah. 
it's magic or it's superstition. Um, to me, that is a very low view, a very ignorant, uninformed view of what is really going on when you venerate a relic. The sacramental, well, first of all, relics do not have magical powers, and I'm going to explain to you why, why that is. Uh, the sacramental system of the church is the opposite of magic. Because magic, you see, there is something that you have that is material that is regarded as the cause of something spiritual. Y'all tracking me? Anybody? In magic, you have something that is material that is viewed as the cause of something spiritual. So you have something material that would have a spiritual effect. And who is the promoter, instigator, cause of that effect? Satan. Well, okay. <laughs> um, I was thinking more of the individual, right? That that's the idea behind magic, is that somehow I could take something material and achieve a spiritual effect. So this is a very, what, what Protestants are saying is a very low view not only of the understanding of the incarnational theology of the church, but a complete misunderstanding of how the sacramental system in the church actually works. Because a lower cause affecting a, or achieving a higher effect is the inverse of what we do. Our theology is that the highest possible cause in the spiritual realm brings about the effect in our material world. Do I need to say that again? Do y'all see how those two things are opposite? Yeah. They're opposite. So when you venerate a relic, you're not, you're, not, you're not performing magic. You're not saying to this relic, I want some spiritual effect, right? You are praying through the intercession, through the holiness of that individual, that there will be a higher cause that will bring about a material effect. Do I need to test y'all on this? Everybody want to take home an essay or something about this? But do you, do you understand the difference? So what, what, what Protestants are really saying when they criticize this is they're reflecting a misunderstanding, a complete misunderstanding of what we do and what we believe about a higher, a higher point of origin, a higher cause for a material effect. Very opposite of what magic might be. Okay, so um, St. Thomas Aquinas, our angelic doctor, uh, further expounds the language that was first used by St. Jerome and St. Augustine um, and makes uh, this very distinctive uh, reference that the reverence which we pay to God and which belongs to latria, it makes this, 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 um, this difference between adoration and veneration, latria versus dulia, that differs from the reverence we pay to certain excellent creatures. Right? So we do not worship creatures, we worship God. We venerate creatures. He makes it, so we're moving on in history now, we're in the high middle ages, he's making this, um, this distinction. His words um, in the Summa Theologica put the cap on this, okay? So we've talked about the Latin doctors, we looked at the, uh, the Second Council of Nicaea and Canon Number 7, and now St. Thomas Aquinas, who is still the authoritative voice in the church, right? He put the cap on this, so we don't even have to talk about it anymore, right? Until the 16th century in the Protestant movement. But anyway, um, I talked about, about these abuses. And, I, and again, I, I just say this because I, I do think we cannot avoid this. We have to acknowledge it. And I think the best way we do it is to own it and say, yes, there were abuses. And boy, we're so glad that the church today is, is much more aware and much more proactive. Uh, so much so that we have an entire a curia, the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, that addresses this. Okay. The, um, the following words, and I, may not, I may not have time to get to this, we'll see. Let me go back to this. The following words are not mine. I'm going to clarify this. Nor are they the words of any saint of the church. And maybe I'll let you guess who said this. Quote, it is claimed that the head of St. John the Baptist is in Rome. 
Although all history show that the Saracens opened John's grave and burned everything to powder. Yet the Pope is not ashamed of his lies. So with reference to other relics like the nails and the wood of the cross, these are the greatest of lies. Martin Luther. How did y'all guess that? <laughs> Just guess that. But remember, Martin Luther, in his historical context, let's keep historical perspective, he is reacting to a very real situation, these abuses that had to be corrected. He's reacting to that. Um, so, you know, and as I said, the, the head of John the Baptist, it could be in Rome, it could be in Amiens, in France, it could be in Damascus. There's three of them. Um, this is the sort of thing that the Protestant movement was able to serve, I think, a, a very needed open call to reform about. All right, so there's a whole lot more, y'all, that I could say about this. Um, we talked about the fact that our um, veneration of relics reflects beautifully the foundational doctrine of Christianity, which is the incarnation. All of created material, everything that is created is imbued with God's grace. The saints have that in a, in a special and more abundant way. And so even the tiniest piece of relic of a saint, remember to leave behind, is imbued with incredible grace that is a conduit for us to the divine when we properly approach that. Um, it reflects, going back to that Lex Aronde, Lex Credendi, it reflects that we believe in eternal life. We believe they have left something behind because they have gone on. The fact that we ask them for intercessory prayer reflects this belief in eternal life and that they are right there with us in full communion with us, as the, as the Apostles' Creed says. That we believe in the communion of saints. Okay, so it is scriptural, it is traditional, it's creedal. Um, and well, I think I would be remiss to not mention this. Clearly, what's reflected in this, in this teaching and practice of ours is that we believe in the sanctity of the human body. The beauty of the human form as a created being, that we are creatures of grace. Um, the sanctity of our human form. So as I said, there's, there's just so much more that I could have talked about. We could be here until, until next week. Um, but this is a little perspective I want to leave you with about intercessory prayer to saints and our veneration of relics of saints uh, out there in the world that we live in to keep the perspective that there are 2.2 billion Christians on the planet, right? I'm sorry, 2.2 billion Christians who affirm what we affirm the veneration of relics, the intercessory prayer of the saints. 2.2 billion of us, so you're not alone out there, even though in Shreveport, Louisiana, it might feel like it sometimes, right? There's not. 1.6 billion of us are Roman Catholic and Orthodox Christians who believe this. Okay? So, 2.2 billion Christians in the world, and the overwhelming majority of us believe this to be valid teaching and valid practice. Why? because it is scriptural, it is tradition, it's in our sacred tradition, it's affirmed in every major doctor, father of the church, going back to the very beginning. Um, we have canons of the ecumenical councils that have weighed on it, and as the Council of Trent said so beautifully, why multiply proofs? Why multiply proofs? So, it's 10.30, any questions? As I said, I could go on, but let's don't. I mean, I could go on. Um, any questions, comments? Okay, so um, I'm going to ask you to turn that off if you don't mind. Thank you.